Hey, hey, hey. Time for another Out of This World story from our space. Fooled my cheating soon-to-be ex-wife into thinking I was cheating. Then, thermonuclear shinobi ghosted and served her Christmas day. I hope you've got some time and a snack, because this one is going to be super long, as the events that follow span from late 2019 to last week. As per the rules, all names are altered herein. Okay, so here's the backstory. My soon-to-be ex-wife was my high school sweetheart. We started dating in 1992 when we were both 17. We're both 45 now, and have been together ever since. She's the only woman I've ever been with my entire life. We married five years later at 22, fresh out of college. A year later, we had our first of two children, both boys, 22 and 17. 23 years I gave to her, built her a house, worked my butt off to give her the life she wanted. Sure, we had rough patches, but what marriage doesn't? Even in the worst of times, we found a way to pull through and come out the other side better, which made the discovery of her affair that much more jarring. Flashback to March 2020, when I first got the feeling something was off. For a good two months prior, we were in a funk. I was on the mend from reconstructive knee surgery, blew out my ACL in fall of 2019, but still lacking in movement. At the time, I only had about 55% range of motion on my knee. This took a toll on quite a lot in the house. I was out on workers' comp, as I had been injured on the job, and I was unable to do my usual household duties, so I got a lot backed up. My sons would do what they could, but tasks only I was capable of doing had to be put on the back burner, or my wife had to do, which she wasn't pleased with. Things also crawled to a standstill in the bedroom between us. It had already slowed down prior to my injury, but in the state I was in at the time, it completely stopped. During these months, she, we'll call her Sue, was spending more time hanging out with coworkers after work. Between November of 2019 and March of 2020, it was regular occurrence for her. Naturally, I thought nothing of it. I've never in the 23 years I'd been with her had any reason to worry or not trust her. She has her friends, I have mine, and we have mutual. I'd go hang out with my friends all the time and there was no issue. It was all above board. It was around January of this year that I noticed something odd. Sue started getting noticeably distant with me. Sure, we were in a funk, but she'd never deny me affection to that point. The usual hugs and kisses she'd give me came to a halt. Her phone was attached to her hand long before my suspicions grew, but she'd always share and show me things she'd discovered on the web. Do-it-yourself ideas and recipes on Pinterest, memes, all kinds of stuff. But she was now being guarded about her phone. Even her interactions with me became more snippy, as if she couldn't be bothered. So we're now in March. COVID has arrived and New York City is locked down. Our chosen careers fall under the essential designation, so neither of us have to work from home. I'd just been recently cleared to return to work after five months on the shelf, and I was eager to get back after it. As five months of my butt rehabbing my knee and not being able to do physical stuff drove me nuts. For context, I enjoy physical activities. I'm an avid martial artist, and I'm typically in the gym four days a week, on top of all the home projects I did. Within a week or two of the lockdown, my soon-to-be ex-wife alerts me that she's going to have to start putting in extra hours. Again, I think nothing of this because of her field. Of course, I was under the assumption it'd be every other day, but no, it was every day. And not just an hour or two. She'd come home three or more hours later and go straight to the shower, spend a little time with me, a little time with our 17-year-old, 22-year-old lives with a girlfriend across town, and then go to bed. As I'm able to support myself on my knee better, we started getting intimate again. But as you'd probably guess, she wasn't mentally or emotionally present for it, which I noticed quickly. So by April, the picture started getting clearer to me. All of the signs were pointing to the idea that she was having an affair. That's when I decided I needed to find answers. So I scoured the internet on things I should be looking for, signs of infidelity in one's partner, and sure enough, she was pretty much ticking all of the boxes on such behavior. So then my search inquiry advanced to how I find proof. I started with her social media. Looking at her Facebook entries from months prior, it's pretty much the usual. Pics of us and our sons, pics with her and her friends, and more than a few pics of her nights out with coworkers. In these pics, it's a mixed bag of her closest friends from work, and a couple folk I've never met from her work. But I see one recurring thing in a number of these pics. One guy. In every picture he's in. He's rather uncomfortably close to her. His arm is around her shoulder, or his hand on her lower back. Way too close for a guy I've never personally met. Needless to say, that put a sour taste in my mouth. But that wasn't the worst of it. No, no, no. The worst was the fact that apparently this dude is a friend of hers on Facebook and follows her on Instagram. So I go to look up his Facebook account and wouldn't you know it, I'm blocked. Why the hell am I blocked from seeing this guy's Facebook account but he's friends with her on Facebook? Yep, 
Now I'm in Batman detective mode. At that point, I wasn't even trying to deny it. I knew she was cheating on me with this guy. My mission was to find out for how long, and over the course of April and May, that's what I did. You know, I never had any clue the depth of info you could secure from the phone, text, and email records up until then. We have a family plan, cell phone package, and I was able to pull up quite a bit of data. My soon be ex-wife's data history was telling. The two most frequent numbers she had interacted with from October of 2019 to April 2020 was my own, and a number I'd never seen before. Take a wild guess whose number it was. A quick check on Google and I confirmed it was the dude from the photos who blocked me on Facebook. We'll call him POS, cause that's what he is. Again, the picture becomes even more clearer at this point, but a lot of their messages and texts were disjointed, which meant she was deleting a lot of them. I knew she was cheating on me with this guy, but nothing in the data could serve as a smoking gun. I needed more evidence. It's at this point that I tell my best friend Oz what I had found. He asked me did I confront her with what I had, and I said no because I feel like it wasn't enough. That's when he told me about an app that I could download and apparently spy on her communications in real time. I won't say the name as I don't know the rules on that here. I got it installed, sync up my data plan, and waited. Within days of doing so, I finally saw it. A text string between the two of them talking about how much fun they'd had the previous night and making plans to do it again that weekend. Boom. Gut punch. To say I was completely devastated was an understatement. I guess that moment counts as my D-Day, and for the next two days after, I was just broken. I actively distanced myself from her those two days immediately after D-Day, which she was noticeably shaking by. She tried to console me and ask me what was wrong, but I'd brush it off and leave her presence. I couldn't even look at her. This woman, who I gave 23 years of my life to, who I have given everything I could and more to as a husband, and she stepped outside of our marriage for a guy just five years older than our eldest son. By the third day, I wasn't even sad anymore. I was pissed. I contacted Oz to let him know my suspicion was confirmed, and he asked me had I confronted her yet. My answer was no, and I told him I wanted payback. I didn't just want to divorce her, I wanted to destroy her. I wanted to leave her life in shambles and freaking ruin her. It was going to take time to do so, and I devised a plan. In my readings and research on infidelity, I had saw a quote that resonated with me that went, the enemy of infidelity is unpredictability, or something to that ilk. That was going to be the basis of my plan. I was going to make her life hell on wheels while also secretly planning my exit strategy. So we're now in early June and I've still got the app installed. Pretty much every night, I'm gathering as much data as I can seeing their back and forth messages. They're talking like it's a full-blown relationship they're in. Sexting, lovey-dovey romantic stuff, nudes, the whole freaking bag. At that point, I had stopped looking at any of it. I was just collecting info and cataloging on my private FPS server. Meanwhile, I started doing things out of the ordinary. I start going out at odd times. I start coming home even later than she does. In her presence, I'm on my phone a lot more than usual, and when she asks, what are you up to? I just simply say, just stuff, and put my phone away. I'd also change my login info on everything, so she couldn't access any of my stuff. Mind you, for our entire marriage, we've never hid anything from each other. But right around, I'm assuming the start of her affair, she'd changed her password on Facebook, as well as on her phone, stating, she had to because of the security breaches in recent months. Yeah, really nice cover for hiding your affair from your husband. Anyway, I'd clued Oz in on my plan, as well as telling my older, and only, sister, and two more of my closest friends what was going on. These are people I trust without life. I swore them to secrecy. For context, Oz and I have been friends since we were kids. The other of our friends, Joey and Nina, we've known since high school. Make note of Nina, she comes into play down the road. July comes, and my soon-to-be ex-wife is in full paranoia mode. She's texting and calling a lot more frequently now, asking me if I'm going to be home when she gets home, when am I coming home while she is and I'm not, asking me what I'm up to, the works. I can see the seed planted in her head the month prior is starting to sprout, especially in her communication with POS. She's confiding in him her doubt and confusion, telling him that I'm getting cold and distant. The freaking nerve of this woman! In the interim of these interactions with POS, she suggests that maybe they should stop meeting up at our house because she has no idea if I'd just show up confirming that yes, she's had this jerk in my home. Thanks, Sue. POS asked her in that specific communication was she worried about me potentially cheating on her, which actually pissed her off. I can't even begin to describe the level of joy and how many laughs I got out of reading that exchange. My cheating wife arguing with her affair partner over if she's mad her husband could be cheating on her. Oh, the freaking irony. Now bear in mind, I'm not hooking up with anyone. When I leave, I'm usually at Oz or Joey's throwing back some booze, watching fights and spending time with my bros, or at my big sis's house, hanging with her and my brother-in-law, who's like an older brother to me. My sis is 52 and her hubby is 58. She had told him about my soon-to-be ex-wife's infidelity, 
but not of my plan. Couldn't risk it, as he's a bit of a blabbermouth. Well, fast forward now to October. That's when things seriously pick up. I've been in my faux affair for three months now, and Sue is hyper aware of the fact that I'm actively pulling away from her. It's been as long as the day I enacted my plan until the day she confronted me, October 20th, 2020, that I had even touched her. No hugs, no kisses, no initiation of intimacy, nothing. Not like she needed it, she was still screwing POS, it's just at his place or at motels. So that afternoon, she calls me at work, which wasn't rare before all this began, but certainly hadn't happened in a while, and asked me to come straight home after work, saying she had something important to tell me. I'm not going to lie to you all, I half believe she was going to come clean about her infidelity, but she of course didn't. Instead, I get home to her asking me was I unhappy with her. The freaking nerve. She cites the fact that I've been spending way too much time away from home. I don't show her affection anymore and our sex life has completely died. She tells me she's worried I'm pushing her away because I was resentful of how she treated me in the months I was rehabbing my knee. And then came the punchline. She freaking asked if I was cheating on her. Folks, I fell out on the floor laughing hysterically. And when I say hysterically, I mean joker laughing gas hysterical. On the surface, it looked like, to her assuming, it was me laughing off the notion of being unfaithful. But it was, of course, actually me laughing at the sheer irony of what was happening in front of my eyes. I'm tearing up, pounding on the floor in complete hysterics for a good two minutes before I compose myself enough to answer. I sit up and look her in the eyes for the first time in months, shaking my head. But I didn't give her an answer. I stand up, brush myself off, kiss the top of her head, and go about settling in for the night. Later that night, as I'm in my office, I decide, you know what? Given the brevity of what happened, I wanted to see what she was telling him. So I fire up the app, and sure enough, they're actually texting in real time. She tells POS, I know he's cheating on me. I asked him tonight, and he literally laughed in my face. He fell on the floor and laughed for like five minutes. It wasn't five minutes, obviously. He doesn't even care how I feel anymore. I don't know how or why, but he's gone. I know I've lost him. This is karma. I know it. The smile I had on my face reading that must have resembled the Cheshire cat. She was breaking. POS attempted to console her, saying that if I cared enough for her, she wouldn't have had to come to him to give her what I wasn't giving her. But the tone of her responses told me she was having doubt now. She had the nerve to step out of our marriage because I wasn't able to fulfill my role as a husband due to a legitimate injury and kept the affair going for, at that point, nearly an entire year. But the idea of her losing me to another woman was enough to make her waver? What a freaking weakling. Now, during all of this, I was also exacting the second part of my plan of payback, getting all of my affairs in order financially. In September, I had met with a family attorney to get the ball rolling on divorce papers, with the mountain of evidence I had piled up to that point. New York is an at-fault state as far as divorce, and the overwhelming amount of proof I'd gathered displaying Sue's infidelity pretty much solidified I could nail her to the freaking wall in a divorce case. My lawyer instructed me to get all of my financials in order in preparation for whatever division of assets might come as a result. I went one better than that, secretly pulling all of my money out of our joint account and putting it in my personal account. I also started shopping around for an apartment as part of phase two. We're now in November, and I've not changed my behavior. In fact, I've ramped it up. This is where my friend Nina comes into play. For context, Nina and Sue have never been what you call close. I met Nina freshman year of high school two years before I met Sue. Even way back then, Sue has seen Nina as a threat, as she's my closest female friend. There's always been an applied, I don't trust her, from Sue regarding Nina. She's never addressed it directly, but it's obvious to anyone who pays attention. Conversely, Nina's never been a big fan of Sue. Early in me and Sue's relationship, Nina called to attention to me how Sue was pretty much imposing herself in our little square of friends, whereas I didn't do the same with Sue's set of friends. That irked Nina because she knew why Sue was doing it. Her. Among Sue's circle even now, there are no male friends, aside from POS whereas Nina is the only girl in my square. Nina had been stuck overseas due to the virus and finally returned to New York City November 3rd. Oz, Joey, and I decided we were going to celebrate her return with a night at Joey's house for dinner and drinks. There was only five of us, Oz, Joey, Joey's wife, who is also Nina's sister, Nina, and myself, sticking to CDC guidelines. We take the Rona very seriously. Nina, being the evil mastermind she is, comes up with an evil idea to trigger Sue. She suggested we take some photos in the same vein of the photos I discovered of Sue and POS months prior and post them to my Facebook. And that's what we did. It wasn't until the 5th that Sue got wind of it, as I'm guessing a few friends noticed my updates and saw how uncomfortably close I was with Nina. This really effed her mind up, because she still believed I was cheating, and I can almost guarantee she wanted to accuse Nina, 
but she knew that Nina had been stuck in Europe for the majority of the year. Still didn't stop her from attempting to dress me down that night for being so, as she said, handsy in the pics. I saw this as a golden opportunity to deliver the lead jab for my knockout blow. I say, so what about the pics with you and POS from last year? He was pretty handsy in them, but did you see me get bent out of shape over it? Deer in headlights. It was the first time I even mentioned the dude's name throughout all of this. The hamster wheel in her head started reeling in real time as she tried to explain away those pics. To that point, she hadn't even known I saw them. That's how little I use Facebook. When I actually do post something, it's like an event to people, which is why the pics with Nina specifically got so much traction among our circles. And explain away she did. He's that way with everyone. He's just a really friendly guy. I can see how it looks, but there's nothing there. I'm sorry if those pics hurt you. I'll delete them. No, no. The pics aren't what hurt me. The year you've been screwing the dude whilst lying to me that you're working extra hours and hanging with friends is what hurt me. But vengeance, as Lieutenant Commander Worf from Star Trek The Next Generation so famously said, is a dish best served cold. For that night, Sue was being extremely clingy and attentive to me, like annoyingly so. She's trying to initiate affection and intimacy with me, and I'd stonewall her at every chance. All the while, I'm still archiving everything she's saying to POS. Mind you, by this point, I'd long since gone numb. Any desire I might have had to save my marriage was dead. I'd checked out the day I enacted the first phase of my plan. So confiding in him that I've gotten worse, that she doesn't know what to do, and she feels like I absolutely hate her, I do, then comes the bombshell. She says she can't see him anymore. The guilt is too much for her, and she feels like karma is suffocating her. She can't risk losing me. She says that she loves POS deeply, but she is still in love with me, and she has to save her marriage before she loses me. No, my dear, you're about eight months too late for that. POS loses his crap, saying such lovely things as, he doesn't love you the way I love you, and you're making a mistake. You can't just throw me away like this. That text chain would be the last they'd have until about three weeks ago. Throughout the remainder of November and December, she is stuck in limbo. She's trying to gauge where my headspace is and is still unable to tell if I'm actually being unfaithful. Meanwhile, POS is steadily blowing her phone up daily. She's not responding to him. I'd see her check her phone often, then quickly put it away. Meanwhile, phase two of the plan was now officially complete. The divorce papers were done. I'd found me a studio apartment in Co-op City, New Yorkers will know the area, and signed a two-year lease on it. All of my money was in my personal account. I was ready to throw my haymaker. So we're now at Thanksgiving. My oldest and his girlfriend were hosting a small gathering of our immediate families. So them, oldest and his girlfriend, oldest girlfriend's parents, she's an only child, myself, Sue, and our youngest. We have a great night. My oldest girlfriend is studying to be a chef, and she did all the cooking herself. The girl can freaking cook, let me tell y'all. As I had to keep up appearances of nothing being wrong between Sue and I, I initiated affection with her several times that evening. Kisses on the cheek, cute little hugs, wrapping my arms around her shoulder from behind. The gestures didn't go unnoticed by her, as she reveled in it. Bear in mind, this was the first time I touched this woman since I kissed the top of her head the night she confronted me in October. So just about two months. Not gonna lie, I felt repulsed doing it, but I had to. I couldn't risk the plan, and me being distant to her in the face of my boys, my oldest girlfriend, and her parents would set off alarms. So my youngest decides he wants to stay over with his big bro for the night. So Sue and I head home. On the drive home, she thanks me for being so good to her and says, I don't know what you're going through, baby, but I'm here for you. I had to hold off busting out the maniacal laughter again and responding, saying, I know, I just need time. So for the first time, realistically, since springtime, we had sex that night. I figured, screw it. With what I'm about to do, may as well get some action before I delete her from my existence. I won't go into detail, but I wasn't lovemaking. When I was finished, she was a lump of flesh laying there trying to figure out the direction of the truck that ran her over. No cuddling or anything after. I just got up, showered, and went to go to sleep in my office. To her confusion though, I used a condom. First time two dang decades I did. She was definitely perplexed by it, but she didn't ask questions. Sure as hell wasn't going raw on her knowing that she's been doing so with POS for months at that point. I wake up the next day and check my handy dandy spy app, and for the first time in weeks, she responded to POS. Dude went full novella. He professed his love for her, said she was wasting her time trying to rekindle a flame in me that died, that she'd been in a prison with me for 23 years and deserved to experience the love and affection of a man who would cherish her. Mind you, this dude is 27 freaking years old, five years older than our oldest son, and he's that sprung on a 45 year old married mother of two? What a grade A high quality simp. She chose to blow up our marriage and destroy the home we'd built for this dude? Pretty boy with a soft side? 
Ha. She responded saying pretty much the same thing she said when they last talked, that she loves him and enjoyed their time together, but she can't lose me. I'm still the love of her life, but she'll always have a place for him in her heart. That they can still be friends if he chooses, but the physical relationship between them is over. He begged her to see him one last time that week. And yep, you guessed it. She said yes. One more for the road, right? Who am I to say anything? That's what I did to her the previous night. Of course, I added all that to the archive I'd compiled. December 4th is when phase three, the final phase of Operation Shinobi Ghost started. The divorce papers were in hand. My new place of residence was set up. Now I had to slowly start moving my stuff out of the house. But first, I had to break the news to my boys. I called my oldest to the house that Friday night, had them join me in my office, and laid everything out on the table. Not the specifics, but that their mother had been cheating on me for over a year, and I was going to be filing for divorce soon. My 17-year-old was especially shaken up by this, because he himself had recently experienced his first take of infidelity. Yep, his first girlfriend had cheated on him just four months prior. Seeing his heart broken a second time at the idea that his own mother was capable of doing this hit him hard. My oldest took it a lot better, and suggested taking his brother in to live with him until this blows over, to which I agreed. We packed up some of his stuff, and he asked me, was I going to be okay? I told him, yes, son, I'm going to be all right, and so are you. We're going to be all right, I promise. And then they were off. The hardest part was now over, and it was now time to arm the nukes. Over the next few weeks, day by day, Oz would help me get a little of my most sensitive stuff out of the house, gave him a list of all the, the definite stuff to grab while Sue and I were at work, and left him the spare key. This was all the stuff Sue wouldn't notice was missing unless you told her it was gone. I'd also gotten a new phone and phone number, and told everyone who needed to know. Oz, Joey, Nina, my boys, Big Sis, and my mother. My new contact info. Meanwhile, I'm keeping up the ruse with Sue that she's non the wiser, trickling bits of pieces of affection to her just to keep her off the trail, while she's still in contact with POS. Not to the extent that they'd been prior, but there's still an emotional thing happening. The fog is faint, but it's still there. All the while, I gather everything, and I do mean everything. Every bit of data I've archived since I started the plan, call logs, texts, pics, emails, everything, and start making printouts. Folks, I must have spent over $1,500 on staple supplies. Printer ink, paper, binders, the works, and I cataloged everything in order from the beginning of the affair until the last bit two weeks ago, December 16th, in the binders. 14 of them. I then put each one in a box and gift wrapped each, addressing them to various people. My mother, my father passed seven years ago, her parents, her two sisters, her brother, her HR department, did I forget to mention POS works for the same company and there's an expressed rule against her interrelationships because of the nature of what she does? Several of her friends, POS and POS's parents, lugged all those efforts to the post office and shipped them all out December 16th. ETA for delivery? December 22nd through the 24th. Perfect. So we're now at Christmas Eve. Sue comes home around the usual time. No idea if she'd seen POS. I'd stop tracking her on the app the 18th. Figure I'd gotten all the mileage I needed from it. As per usual, she showers, hangs out with me a bit. I blow her back out on the living room couch. I know, I'm a freaking a-hole. And she turns in for the night. The final phase was upon me at long last. The nuke I'd been arming since June was finally about to launch. In the middle of the night, I woke up and wrapped up one of the three remaining binders with the divorce papers taped to the inside cover and set it on my side of the bed with a note that said, Merry Christmas, on it. Next to it, I left my old phone and the business card of my lawyer. I packed up the remainder of my most needed items, enough to fill two backpacks, and I left my home, that I spent 23 years in, for the last time. That, my friends, was one week ago. To Sue, I am completely off the grid, gone, shadow ghosted. She's blocked on Facebook, but still hasn't blocked me for some reason, so I'm keeping tabs on the fallout. It's absolutely glorious. My packages have reached everyone I sent them out to, and Sue is getting crucified. Her youngest sister completely dressed her down. Both of her parents have condemned her. My mom absolutely destroyed her. Like, holy crap. I know my mom has a mean streak, but the things she called Sue were unfreaking holy She'd been frantically trying to find out if anyone knows where I am, but those that do aren't saying a word. All over her Facebook feed, she's desperately trying to reach me because I'm guessing she knows I'm likely looking, but I'm not saying a freaking word to her without my lawyer present. That'll be the next time I share oxygen with her. She's got no way of spinning the narrative to paint me as the bad guy because I've exposed her to everyone who matters to her. And from what a mutual friend who works in the same company as her, she and POS apparently are being put on administrative leave as of tomorrow. So yeah, chances are she'll be going into 2021 unemployed. As for the final two binders, well, 
One has been turned over to my lawyer as my final bit of evidence for my impending divorce, and the last one I put into my storage unit to be burned in Joey's fire pit when the divorce is final. Do I feel guilty about this? No, not even in the slightest. 23 years I did right by this woman. I gave her the home she wanted. I gave her the family she wanted. I gave her the life I felt we both deserved, and I loved her unconditionally. Never have I faltered. Never have I strayed. Never have I even entertained the notion of breaking any vows. When an issue came up that I felt was affecting our marriage, I came to her and told her, and we sorted it out as best we could. She opted to find comfort in another man's bed. Rather than come to me and say she was unhappy with our sex life at the time, she decided to step out with the young punk who gave her the tingles. So no, I have no sympathy for what I did, or for her. She can burn in hell for all I care. The most I stand to lose is my house, a car, and maybe a couple hundred bucks a month in alimony. But seeing as the divorce is filed under the statute of adultery and New York State is an at fault, that might get waived with the insurmountable amount of evidence I've provided. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead to me and I'm never looking back. Quick edit. New York State is not fully at fault. Under certain circumstances, a divorce can be filed at fault, of which my lawyer has informed me my case falls under. I'll be meeting the soon-to-be ex-wife with her lawyer tomorrow. I'm guessing I'll just update here. Second edit. To the guy on YouTube and in my PM who said I got cucked for over a year and all of my evidence will not be submittable in court claiming he's a retired PI with 20 years experience, you can F right the F off. Had a quick word on the matter with my lawyer earlier today, 1521, and everything provided outside of the phone calls are valid. Find something better to do with your time than harassing me, buddy. Update 1. Okay, so since none of the other relationship subs are allowing me to post an update, and I can't post a new topic on r slash nuclear revenge, I'm putting the update here on my profile. There are two key events that happened over the course of the last two weeks that I want to highlight before the meeting with my soon-to-be ex-wife and her lawyer. Original post can be read here. Christmas Day was the first full day I spent in my new apartment. It's still a work in progress, as I have more stuff I want to get, but overall, I've made it my home, since I'm going to be here for two years at least. My boys and the eldest girlfriend came over and spent a good portion of the day with me. The girlfriend brought over treats she'd made and also whipped up a really nice meal. I got to sit and talk with my sons in a way I hadn't done in a really long time, and it was nice. My big sis also came over with more goodies and hung out with us also. It had been the first time she'd seen her nephews in nearly a year. Having all of them around me did some real good, as if I were by myself I think I would have just drank myself into a stupor. Everyone cleared out around 8ish and I decided I wanted to go hang out with Joey and his wife Claudia. Hung out with them for a couple of hours, had a couple drinks, and then went back home. The next biggest development happened last week, 12-29-20. Around midday, I get a text from Nina asking if I was busy that night. I of course wasn't, so we agreed to meet up after I got off of work. She shows up and we go to dinner not far from where I work. Here in New York City, we're doing indoor dining at 25% capacity thanks to the Rona, but there's mostly no trouble getting seats because so many of us opt not to dine out as much these days regardless. So after we're seated and order our food, Nina pretty much lays all of her cards on the table, and honestly, I knew this was coming. She basically confessed that she's like me all the way, back since we were teenagers, but never got the chance to tell me since Sue swooped in and scooped me up before she could. For context, I've known Nina longer than Sue by two years. As I mentioned, she's been the fourth point of my social square of myself, Oz, and Joey. We were the social outcasts in high school, the raver kids who didn't fit into all of the cliques. Back then, Nina had a weight problem and was diabetic. She was the heavyset goth chick who was super cool, but no guy would ever give her a second glance at. But we always had chemistry. These days, Nina is a personal trainer and yoga instructor. She was the ugly duckling who grew into one hell of a beautiful swan, if I must say. Long story short, we decided that upon the finalization of my divorce, we were going to start seeing each other. And yeah, I slept with her that night. Took her back to my new pad, and we had a grand old time. Am I ashamed of sleeping with her? Hell no. Nina's been a better friend to me than Sue ever was. That's not saying Sue wasn't my best friend, but through the near quarter of a century I've known Nina, she's always supported me, even so much as I learned that day, willingly taking a step back from her own feelings to allow me to pursue and eventually start a life with Sue. That resonated with me on a level I didn't think it would. That kind of selflessness towards another person is the definition of real love. I know, it sounds like I'm just trying to justify in my head that sleeping with her was the right decision. To me it was, and I plan on exploring what's to come with Nina and I with total commitment. Okay, on to yesterday the day I met my wife and her lawyer to discuss the divorce. It's now been two weeks since I ghosted my soon-to-be ex-wife. This past Monday, I got a phone call from my lawyer that Sue's attorney has scheduled a meeting for us to discuss the terms of divorce on 1-6-21, which was yesterday. 
I met with him Tuesday morning to discuss the terms I'm wanting. Long story short, uncontested divorce under the grounds of marital neglect from Sue. My terms are full division of assets, and me selling my half of the house ownership to her. She can have it. We keep our respective vehicles. I keep my cabin in the Poconos. And under the pretenses of marital neglect, she gets no spousal support from me. As for 17, what I'll refer to my son as from here on, he's free to choose who he wants to reside with following the divorce, which will most likely be me. So Wednesday comes and I show up to my lawyer's office dressed in my Johnny Cash best. My wife and her lawyer. She looks like crap, barely holding it together. I give the stone face. I won't bore you with the lawyer babble, but her lawyer presented an offer for terms of reconciliation. I shot them down almost as soon as she finished listing the details of the request. Like I said, I'll spare you the details of the meeting. Long story short, we agreed to a legal separation leading to an uncontested divorce. The only revision is that I will pay her $653 a month of temporary spousal support to cover the cost of utilities until she's gainfully employed again. Yep, she got fired for screwing POS. He got canned as well, up to a year after the finalization. I make enough that it won't hurt me financially even if she drags her feet finding a new job. And she's got enough in her savings to live off of for quite some time. Once a full calendar year has passed after the finalization date of the divorce has passed, she's on her own. Small price to pay for being rid of her cheating but It'll take roughly three months for things to go through. So early April, if there's no cock-ups, I'll be free of her. So after the meeting, my lawyer gives me some final words before telling he'll be in touch to update me on the progress of the filing. Back out on the street, Sue chases me down and asks can we talk. I figure I'd give her at least that. She held it together fairly well in the meeting, but outside let the waterworks flow saying how sorry she was and how she never meant it to go as far as it did. She says she never expected to fall in love with POS, but knew when she thought I was cheating how wrong it was to betray her own husband in such a way. She asked could I ever find it in my heart to forgive me, and that maybe in a few years could we try to start over. That she can't imagine what her life is going to be without me. I tell her to start imagining it soon, because this will be the last time I ever speak to or see her. I tell her that 17 is almost a man and old enough to make his own choices as to his own future. I say that I gave her half of my life, and every ounce of love I had unconditionally, and she in her own words, fell in love with another man, that there is absolutely no chance of me ever forgiving her, that all of the love I had for her was slowly kill all of those months that she confided and professed her love to POS, rather than coming to me and telling me she had any form of issue with how things were going with us. I told her I loved who she once was, but I hate who stands before me, and that if I never see her again, it'll be too soon. Here we are on the sidewalk in Midtown Manhattan, her making a scene crying her eyes out, a couple of folk walk on by and give side glances, but at that point, I didn't care. I wasn't about to publicly humiliate her, I pretty much already socially and professionally destroyed her, but I needed to get this last bit of emotion I had for her out. I finished by telling her I didn't regret the 23 years I spent being her husband. I regretted that in 23 years, she decided the easy way out was the better option, and that, and I have your lovely sons of bitches on Reddit to thank for this last one, because it popped in my head just seconds before I said it. For 23 years, I thought she was mine, but it turned out it was just my turn. Put in my Raycons, turned around, and walked the F away. Later that night, her father calls me and apologizes. He praises me for always being a good man to his daughter, and tells me that he raised her better than what she did. Not gonna lie, I'm going to miss the old man. My dad died years ago, so he's always been my default father figure since, but I can't see myself maintaining a relationship with anyone on her side of the family. After that call, I went on Facebook and symbolically changed my relationship status to divorced. Yeah, it's not final yet, but in my eyes, it's over and done. Like I said, when I make a post on Facebook, it's an event. So plenty of folks started hitting me up over Messenger asking questions. And I laid it all out that I filed for divorce with Sue earlier that day. Of course, Nina called me, shocked that I pulled the trigger so fast. Obviously, I was already in the process of it when we spoke, but she had no way of knowing how far it was along. I asked her if she could come over, and of course she comes a running. We knocked boots again, but this time, she stayed the night. We laid in my bed and talked into the wee hours of the morning, and I haven't felt this level of relief and connection in really a long time. Nina gets me, and I can't get enough being around her. Since the day she confided in me, she's all that's been on my mind. Yeah, I know some folk are going to say it's effed up I'm moving on so fast, but as far as I'm concerned, my marriage ended the day POS lets Sue touch his pecker. So I'm about due. So yeah, that's it. That's the end. My divorce is in the works, and I'm moving on to start a relationship with Nina. I know in a comment response to someone I'd say I'd probably not marry ever again, but that was before Nina came clean to me about how she felt towards me, and I can't deny that I feel the same. We're going to take it slow, and we're not announcing anything until the divorce with Sue is legal and official. As for Sue, 
I could give a flying F what happens to her. She could move POS into our old home for all I care. I'll be getting my money for the house over the course of 2021. Four quarterly installments. And aside from the $653 I pay out directly to her savings account monthly, I never have to see or speak to her again. To all of the words of support, encouragement, and praise, I eternally thank you all. Update 2 soon to be ex-wife of 23 years just tried to take the easy way out last night. The hits just keep on coming. I've been sitting on this for hours now. Didn't know where to post this, so this sub seemed appropriate. So, if you want a bit of backstory, check my post history for the details. I'm not keen on how linking to other subs here works, but my previous two entries were viewable in my profile. The quick version is this. I discovered my wife of 23 years, 45 female, was having an affair with a 27-year-old co-worker. We have two sons, 22 and 17. I concocted a plan to completely upend her life, centered around fooling her into thinking I was having an affair myself. I kept the ruse going for over four and a half months while compiling evidence of her infidelity as well as securing divorce papers and planning my exit strategy. Slowly moving my personal belongings from our home to a new apartment, getting a new phone and number, separating my half of our shared income to our joint account, etc. On December 16th, 2020, I gathered every bit of proof of her affair I'd compiled, printed it all out from start to that week, filed it all into 14 binders, packed 11 into gift wrap boxes, and mailed them all out to the most important people in her life, as well as her HR department, with an ETA between 1222 and 1224. On Christmas Eve, while she slept, I took one of the remaining three binders and did the same, only this one I taped the divorce notice to the inside of the cover, and left it on my side of the bed, which mind you, she'd had her lover in a number of times, along with my old phone and my lawyer's business card, and shadow ghosted her. Over the next four days, her life completely imploded. Her family pretty much excommunicated her. Her friends, the ones who didn't know of the affair, ostracized, and my own mother took her to task, calling her the most scathing and vile things you could possibly think of. Her and her lover were also placed on administrative leave and eventually fired. Last week, we had our divorce hearing and settled on a legal separation into uncontested divorce, with a few provisions in place for transitional income since she's now unemployed. I'm to pay out the price for the utilities. $653 a month until either she finds gainful employment or upwards to one year after the date of the divorce's finalization, which is expected to be three months from now. She keeps the house, her car and her half of the shared assets. I keep my half of the assets, my vehicles, car and motorcycle and boat, and my vacation property, cabin in the Poconos. After the hearing, we had one final exchange where she tried to explain away her infidelity and begged me to give her a second chance after the divorce was finalized. I, of course, said no, gave her some choice words, and walked away from her forever. This brings us to last night. As only my closest friends, two sons, older sister, and mother have my new contact info, and I've completely blocked my soon-to-be ex-wife on all social outlets. She has no means of reaching me since I left her Christmas Eve, but some of our mutual friends still do. Last night, I'm hanging out in my apartment, and I get a voice call notification on Messenger from one of said friends, one of the few who hadn't abandoned her following me outing her affair. She didn't waste any time when I answered, and said she had went to check on Sue, the soon-to-be ex-wife, and found her passed out in the bedroom, foaming out of the mouth with two bottles of empty pills next to her. She's in the ICU in critical but stable condition. The doctor said that she will likely pull through. She's clearly not going to be well after. She begged and pleaded for me to come. Her parents and two of her sisters were also there at the hospital. My guess is they were notified after the hospital attempted to notify me, but Sue would still have my old number as her emergency contact. I simply told her no. Sue's not my problem anymore and she clearly decided she wanted to take the easy way out rather than deal with the shame and agony of the 23-year marriage she blew up. I then told her friend that if Sue's family were there, they can help her sort out the pieces. But as far as Sue and I are concerned, there is no Sue and I anymore. I then ended the call. I've had a few hours to sleep on it, and my sons called me this morning asking me if I knew. I told them yes, but I also let both of them know that if they want to be there and supportive of their mother, I will not hold it against them or judge them for it. She is their mother after all but I myself wash my hands of her and care little to nothing about what she does for or to herself anymore. They were both a little taken aback by this, but respected my stance. However, now that the news has broke about her attempt, many of those friends who dropped her are all starting to surface again and saying I need to be there for her, that even despite what she did to me, I need to support her in her time of need. I've also been informed that her affair partner tried to visit her this morning, but wasn't allowed because he's not family. I'm getting dogpiled on to go see her, but I feel nothing for this woman anymore. I haven't for a very long time. I checked out during the process of getting my payback for her betrayal, and I stand by the fact that I don't care at all for what she's done. In fact, it makes me hate her even more. She's the one who was unfaithful. She's the one who thought a near year-long fling with a guy five years older than her oldest son was worth destroying 23 years. 
and now that she has to face the consequences of her choices, she chooses the most selfish way to deal with. Even now, seeing as she's in all likelihood going to survive, she's cultivated immediate sympathy from everyone who took her to task, and I'm being made out to look like the jaded ex-husband unwilling to sympathize for her by most of her family, not her dad. He's reached out to me over the last few hours and said he respects my decision to stay away. It's like I never even truly knew this woman. 23 effing years and it comes to this. Yes, I know the way I broke things off with her may have put her in a poor mental state, but now a whole new can of worms has been opened up because either she had a complete mental breakdown and decided to self-delete herself, or she made an extremely risky and calculated move to call favor back from people who just weeks prior condemned her for betraying me. She cheated on me, and now she's the effing victim? Sorry if this comes off rantish, but I'm here trying to wrap my brain around this. I want to be perfectly clear. I am not going to visit Sue. She waived her right to me caring about her well-being the day she let POS, my personal nickname for her lover, put his penis inside of her. This might come off as heartless, because despite the cool, calm, collected way I've been throughout my whole ordeal, my feelings are still very much raw. But I don't give an F about this woman. Haven't for a very long time. I'm aware I'm going to be vilified by a number of folk here. I don't much give a crap. Think of me however you want. If you were in my shoes, you'd see her actions vastly different. Some of you folks are going to look up my post history and see the history of what I did to her, and you're going to draw the conclusion that her attempt was my fault. That me tormenting her for all those months, fooling her into thinking I was cheating on her while she actively cheated on me, then destroying her socially and professionally as a result was the catalyst for her meltdown. Maybe it was. Maybe I am a heartless sociopath. But as Arthur Fleck so famously said, you get what you freaking deserve. I gave this woman half of my life and did absolutely everything to be the best possible husband she could ever have. By her own admission, I had no bearing in her decision to step outside of her marriage. She did it for her. Her selfishness knows no bounds, and I am glad to be rid of her. If it makes me the bad guy because I will not go see her and never plan on interacting with her ever again, so be it. I hold true to my damn convictions. She made the choice to betray me. She made the choice to put her needs above the needs of our marriage. So now it's my turn to choose to me over everything else. She can rot in the darkest pit of hell for all I care. Let everyone else help her fix her. My obligation to ever care about her well-being ended the day we signed the separation agreement. I just needed to get this off my chest. If you're going to cast judgment on me for feeling how I feel, save it. Like I said above, after 23 years and two children, I never really knew this woman after all. I have no sympathy for her, and I never will. Let her freaking rot. Quick update. I've been informed by Sue's dad that she's been moved from the ICU to the mental health wing. Doctors are still monitoring her mental state. She's conscious and cognitive again, but obviously lethargic. Her father told me she asked did I come to see her, and he said no, and she shut down after. He respectfully said any further news he'll share only if I inquire, because he understands the headspace I'm in. Also, I've scheduled counseling for 17. The first consultation is this coming Monday. Final update. One year after the bombs dropped. If you're not familiar with my tale, just give my profile a look. It's pretty much categorizes the hellscape my life turned into from the summer of 2019 into the early months of 2021. The short version is this. In 2019, I found out my wife of 22 years was having an emotional affair and physical affair with a young man five years older than our oldest son. We have two sons, 23 and 18 years of age. Upon D-Day, I set in motion a plan over the next several months that resulted in the professional and character destruction of my ex-wife. In hindsight, I'm not proud of what I did, but I did it nonetheless, and if given the chance to redo it, I would. It's all in my post history. December 24th was the two-year anniversary of the night I served my ex and left her for good. A lot has happened since that day, and as I look back at where my life was then compared to where I am now, it amazes me that I'm still standing. A lesser man would have broken going through all I did, but several things pushed me to keep going. The first thing was my youngest son. I needed to be the example to him on how you stick up for yourself and not allow your partner to walk all over you or control the narrative. At the time of D-Day, he himself was cheated on by his first girlfriend, so the notion of his own mother doing the same to me as his ex-girlfriend did to him really did a number on him. The second thing was my now girlfriend, Nina. I've known her for 25 years. She's been in my life years before my ex, Sue, was. Over the course of all of this, I'd come to find out that Nina had been into me since day one, when we were teens, but never had the heart to confess. When Sue came into the picture, Nina fell back and let me go, but she's always loved me in the shadows ever since. Seeing me going through what I was going through, I guess she felt it was time to let the cat out of the bag. We've been with each other ever since. So what's happened since the last time I posted on Reddit some nine months ago? Nothing. Life has gone on. Nina and I are now living together and in a civil union. All of the perks of marriage, but none of the headaches. If it ever comes to the point where we decide to part ways, we walk away with everything we brought to the union. 
no lawyers, no messy paperwork. We simply break the contract and go our separate ways. I highly doubt that day will come. Nina was also married years ago, and with a now six, going on seven soon, daughter from it. We both agreed at the start we'd never do marriage again, which prompted us to look into the civil union route. My sons and her daughter are inseparable when they're together. My boys revealed to me they'd always wanted a little sister, and she's pretty much filling the role. Her and 18's relationship has blossomed into the classic big bro little sis dynamic, which I couldn't be more happy for. There was a point in all of this where I feared 18 would completely shut himself off from ever being okay again, but thanks to therapy and lengthy talks to each other, he's come around full circle. Still gun shy around girls his age of course, but I'm not pressuring him. He'll get back on the horse when he's ready. 23 and his fiance are now husband and wife, as of August of this year. The wedding was spectacular, and mostly paid for by her folks. I wanted to chip in, but her father, who I've become good friends with, was well aware of circumstances within divorce and told me he and his wife would cover everything, despite me insisting and in putting in for something. And yes, Sue, my ex-wife, was in attendance. 23 is on better terms with his mother than 18, who hasn't talked to her since the crap show started. Again, that's his choice and I'm not going to force him to maintain a relationship or communication with her until he's ready. The seating arrangements were made so that we'd never lay eyes on each other, though I did get a glimpse of her, or rather what's left of her. The woman I saw wasn't the one I married. She looked frail and weak. Last time I was physically in a room with her, she was 155 pounds. She didn't look anything over 110 pounds. Bags under her eyes big enough to carry groceries. It was clear that the divorce took a hefty toll on her. In my heart, I wanted to feel pity, but I didn't. There was absolutely nothing there. Nina at one point grabbed my arm tight and asked, was I okay? I told her I was fine and that today was about my boy becoming a husband. Nothing more. Carrying off of that, I got probably the best news I could get when we went to 23 and his wife's place for Thanksgiving. She's a chef and lives for big events. I'm going to be a grandpa. His wife was at the time one and a half months pregnant, had a congratulatory cigar with my boy after dinner, and we talked at length about everything. First time we'd really sat down and had a real man-to-man since it all started. He obviously confided in me that he was nervous about it all, and even made mention that he wouldn't know what to do if what happened to me happened to him. I told him you can't force anyone to be loyal. You have no control over what's going on in their head or heart. You can only control yourself and how you handle it. It's how you handle it that defines you. Soft times make you happy. Hard times make you aware. I don't think he's got anything to worry about. His wife worships the ground he walks on and has been in the trenches with him through all of this. I cherish that girl for keeping my son focused on task, like a good woman is supposed to do for their man. Gender reveal is next month, and I kinda hope it's a girl myself. On the home front, Nina and I are in the early process of discussing the possibility of me adopting her little girl and her taking my name. She has her father's last name, but he's been out of the picture since she was one and has made zero attempts to make contact with anyone. Hell, we don't even know if the dude is still alive. He's definitely not in the US anymore. Nina was born here, but is of Albanian descent. Her ex was born in Albania and has dual citizenship. She thinks he's most likely back in Albania and will never see the dude ever again. Nothing is definite, but Nina has made it clear she doesn't want her daughter carrying the dude's name. And that's it. I've been living my life one day at a time, working my tail off and spending time with the love of my life and her darling daughter. Life goes on. So to all of you who read this, who are in the darkness, questioning does it ever end and will you ever heal from the betrayal? The answer is yes. But you have to commit yourself to not letting the darkness pull you in. It's easy to just accept your fate and let it consume you. You mean way more to way too many people to let that happen. The same way a cheater not only ruins their own life, but the lives of those around them. Allowing yourself to be beaten does the same. Reach out to people who love and care for you. Damn the feeling ashamed about it. Walking the path of recovering from infidelity alone is a fool's errand. No good comes of it. Put your faith in those who you know will bolster you. And regarding your cheating ass partner, maybe not go to the lengths I did, but expose the truth once you have it. Find proof. Protect your heart and your assets, plan your exit strategy, and expose your partner for all to see. Never let them control the narrative. Never accept the gaslighting. Never give in to the blame shifting. If your gut is telling you something is wrong, follow that instinct and find out the truth. Never ignore the red flags. When you're wearing rose-colored glasses, they're impossible to see. And with that, I'm officially retiring this account. There's nothing more for me to say here. To the literal thousands of people who have imparted words of encouragement, praise, and insight to me over the last two years, I am forever indebted to you. To the hundreds of people who insist still that my entire ordeal is a made-up book of fiction, if only it were, the internet is a pessimistic place. Believe whatever you want, but if you're investing that much energy into how much something isn't real, maybe you need to get off the internet for a few months. 
spend some constructive time in reality and deal with whatever it is in your lives that make you so jaded. Thank you all. Thanks for reading. Kermit DeFrog, signing off.